Hello and welcome to Bastion Land Broadcasting, where tonight we're looking at something new, um, which if you've been, um, if you've kept up to date with what's happening uh, at Bastionland.com, you will have seen a few hours ago, I posted a, um, I thought I would bite the bullet and put out um, a playtest edition of the thing I've been working on, uh, which is a thing tentatively called um, Primeval bastion land um if you are a patreon subscriber this sounds like a sales pitch i'm being very corporate today uh if you're a patreon subscriber you would have seen backstage uh, a little bit of a peek of this uh, over the last couple of months um but this is a thing that i've been working on um i'm not going to give the full read through now because this is a 40 page pdf that is free on bastionland.com so i'll let people check it out for themselves what I will say, um, in in true terrible design form, I've put like the most important page at the back, which is um, <laughs> uh, notes on like what's the point of this playtest and what am I, what am I asking for in return? Um, because it it would be good to get a bit of feedback on this, but I'm kind of looking for a kind of a specific type of feedback, I guess, um, which is that. The, 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 the spelling, grammar, layout, all that stuff is super rough because this is just meant to be a version that can be tested. Uh, so I'm not focusing on all that stuff. Um, fine details I'm not focusing on at the moment. This is very much a case of does this game, does this game work as a general thing? Because it's quite a bit different to what I've done with some of my other games, um, despite being, despite having a lot in common. So the very basic pitch and in fact i can see a question i'm, I'm not going to do a full q a but i can see a question in the chat from uh from christopher who says whatever became of intergalactic bastion land i feel like i can say with some confidence barring some horrible disaster um i will return to intergalactic bastion land at some point but when i started messing with that idea I never, I was never quite able to get a grip on, I was never quite able to get a grip on how I felt that game would actually play. I had lots of bits and pieces of ideas and I had little bits of the system of Bastion Land that I would like to change to fit it, but, but I didn't have a vision for like how this thing would actually play and how this would be a different kind of game to Into the Odd and Electric Bastion Land. Whereas with this one, I have quite recently reached a point where I do have a kind of vision for it now in the sense of I know how I want the kind of table experience to be uh, for this game and I, I know how I want I know what I want this to be basically um, the real question is how do we get there and is this the right direction to do it um, but the thing that I'm looking at particularly today is um, I am going to give a very quick overview of, of what's going on with this game and then I'm going to get on to the domain mapping because this is a game all about it's really all about into the odd was designed it, it into the odd does lots of things but the main thing i designed it for for me was to do dungeon crawls it does do wilderness travel as well and settlement stuff but into the odd was designed primarily as a very simple dungeon crawl exploring game for me electric bastion and was designed to be a city game for me because I design all my games for myself I'm very selfish I design them because they're things that I want to exist for myself because I've not been fully satisfied by other games that I found um, and this is looking at the idea of how I want like a how I want a hex crawl to be but I know that the word hex crawl has a lot of baggage with it uh, positive and negative and it's not a standard hex crawl but I wanted to capture some of the idea and the some of the things that feel cool about a hex crawl to me um, and what kind of world would support that kind of thing and, and how would that fit in with the kind of the, <laughs> the expanded bastion and universe um, I'm going to do like a 90 minute video essay on the the complex timeline of of bastion and but we'll, we'll save that for another day so you are knights but you're not historical knights because this is not a historical world. Despite having lots of elements of medieval stuff, um, this is a world of myth. And this is a world that only exists in myth, except now it exists for real. And it's a place you can go to. 
in Bastionland. Um, I've mentioned before that traveling from Bastion into Deep Country is very much like traveling back in time. Well, is it much of a stretch to travel back to a past that never existed? Is the very pretentious uh, overarching <laughs> framing device for this. Um, that's only really if you want to know how it connects to Electric Bastionland. Um, in reality, you don't really need to worry about it. All you need to know is this is a world of myth come to life. It is not a historical, um, it is not an attempt at a historical uh, game of knights. Um, the good thing about um, being focused around myth is that um, any story that some any story that someone tells you is destined to be true in some shape or form. There's no such thing as just a myth. Myths have power. And as a knight, uh, there are lots of different types of knights. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a man in armor on a horse with a lance. That it, it can be much wider than that. Um, but you will have sworn an oath to find the city, protect the weak, and witness the myths. And the city is the shining haven that we have only seen in our dreams. Some call it Bastion, Bav Babylon, or Bastion. So it's 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 walking a line where it's it is silly. I, I accept that. Um but <laughs> um I'm hoping it kind of evokes some of the feel that I'm going for of this kind of this kind of unreal past come to life almost i'm not going to go over the rules they are essentially the core of electric bastion land with some bits taken out and a few little bits added in the main thing is this burdens system which are essentially like bulky items but they're bulky items that exist in your mind so they're things like or not not quite in your mind they're things like being fatigued uh having an excess of vanity, an excess of wrath, an excess of um, of woe will all weigh on you and you have to do something specific to get rid of your burden. And if you have three or more burdens, that's bad. Um, and this opens up a few nice little extra things. So scars also function as burdens now, essentially, although they are very similar to the list in Electric Bastion Land. Um, and quests are also burdens that you can choose to take on yourself. You can say, I pledge that I am going to behead the goblin or whatever. And then that is a burden until you complete the quest. And when you complete the quest, you do get a little mechanical reward, which I'm not sure about yet. But, but I'm not entirely happy with this. But if, if I pointed out everything I'm not happy with in this yet, um, we'd be here all night. Um, it does have some... The, the joke of advanced into the yard continues because it does have some extra combat stuff. Um, you have a few little uh, at will attacks that you can do, not quite at will, um, that are special things you can do because you are a knight. Because you're not, you're not quite the. Even though you're creating a character is very similar to Electric Bastionland, you're not like the kind of weird loser that exists in Bastionland with a big debt. At the very least, you are a knight, so you are expected to have some. You've got some moves, you know, <laughs> like so. You've got a few things that you can do that uh, even if you roll very badly, you will still have some interesting decisions to make in combat. Uh, Wugino asks, is this primarily based on Arthurian myth? It is definitely based on... Whenever people ask me about whether it's based on something similar with Electric Bastion Land, because I'm very bad at reading things, I often kind of absorb things secondhand. So it, it is it is drawing on the bits and pieces that I know of sort of Arthurian myth and or the sort of the, the matter of Britain or whatever it's called that that whole like that whole area of like British mythology sort of um, between sort of Rome and the end of the early medieval period um, but it's it's also based on an, anything that was like someone's idea of the past is what I'm drawing on and I'm drawing a lot on British stuff because that's what I've been reading a lot of recently and that's what I've got a lot of access to and I'm very immersed in here um, but I also wanted it to feel like you could come into it with a different perspective and it wouldn't feel like, oh, this is, this is a game of British myth. They're all British references. I wanted to capture some of the mood without some of this, without the specifics of, oh, you need to know about Black Shook or whatever for this to work. Like, no, if, if it's a big, big, scary dog 
you know that that works with lots of uh, different cultural references. Um, I'm going to have to do a really quick um, interval because I've heard my doorbell go and I am on my own. So I'll be back. Right, we're back. So there are some extra mechanical bits, like I said. But the main thing that I wanted to talk about today is how is this different to... Is, is this just, oh, we're going to put some extra combat rules in. But other than that, it's, it's Electric Bastion and again. And it's not because I wanted to explore the idea of... Um, hex crawling or at least the things that I like about the idea of hex crawling so what we're going to do is we are going to create a domain because a domain is kind of the it's the equivalent of like a borough in Electric Bastion and in that it's an area that you would probably be comfortable preparing it and that would get you through at least one session of the game and I wanted to have a procedure like the procedure for boroughs in Electric Bastion Line because I know that that's something that I find very useful. But yeah, we're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have a go. So I am using uh, HexTML, which is a browser-based uh, hex editor, and we're just gonna go through it one step at a time. I'm gonna follow it by the book, and we're gonna see see how it goes. So. Brace yourself. A domain is a map with a hexagonal grid covering the loose influence of a seat of power. So 12 by 12 hex is a good starting point. And then this is, I'm not sure about this yet. This, this is the point where I'm like, is this too silly? The distance covered by each hexagon is known as a hex league, commonly a hex. This distance represents a few loose factors. So in calling it a hex in setting, you can have your characters say something like, oh, it's three hexes that way, which part of me really likes because I like that kind of plain speech of like, look, let's just say, let's just say what the players need to hear to make the decision rather than saying, oh, it's three fathoms that way. And then players sort of having to convert that to hexes in their brain. Um, and the other thing is I've, I, when I when I first started writing this, it was based around the idea of the um, the six mile hex, which I kind of appreciate the philosophy behind. But I actually think for hexes, for me, I would rather they be a bit more loosely defined. So I've def tried to define them by like three kind of real world things that would be affecting people in this kind of faux medieval society. So. A hex is an area within which a hilltop fort or tower can see and be seen. So as I was writing this, we went for a walk up a big hill um, near me. Um, and we, we walked up this big hill, which is in a kind of disused quarry. And it, it's a really good way to like, you can survey the area around you. And I thought this is kind of what I mean by a hex. Like if you go up a big hill and you can see a few, a few towns or a few villages, you can see some woods, you can see some, um, you know, st stuff that you can see, you might see if a big army was coming to get you, that kind of distance. And as soon as you try and put a number on that, I hit some problems because I want to find the perfect number and there's no perfect number for that because it depends on so many factors to do with height and um, the terrain. And it's it's better to just say a hex is an area where if you stand in the if stand in a hill or a fort in the middle of a hex, you can survey the hex around you. It's also the distance a walker can hike and return home before dark. So it's this needs a bit of rewording, but essentially what it means is, if you are a um, I don't know a, a woodcutter, um, you can probably walk to the neighbouring hex, do some chopping, and get back. So most people will not travel beyond sort of their hex and the neighboring hexes. I wanted it to be a significantly large area. And it is an area that can be patrolled or surveyed in a day by a small group of knights. So it makes each hex feel kind of almost more like a, um, in, certainly the inhabited hexes. It's a bit more of a, almost a political distinction rather than a physical distinction. So it's like a small area that is bound by its proximity to each other rather than saying this is a strict six mile area across. Um, yeah, Technoscale says Dyson refers to them as one hand wave of travel. And yeah, in 
in general terms, a hex is the distance that you can walk in one in one phase. And I use um, I use three phases in a day. So if if you're not worried about setting up camp, you can walk two hexes. If you if you do want to set up camp, you can walk one hex a day. Because I wanted it to be a game about traveling across the land. I didn't want it to be too easy to get across. I wanted each hex to kind of matter. So let's actually do it. Enough talking. So this is a guideline. You don't have to do it this way. <laughs> I always feel like, do I need to put these things in? But I think, I, I always used to think I'm not going to write these kind of sentences because it's worthless, because everyone knows that you can just do what you want. But I think it does help give people a little push sometimes. There's certain, certain people do find that useful. Uh, so most of the terrain is wildland, which is just a word meaning an area that is untamed terrain and it's not inhabited. So we want a, a range of terrain types. Now I'm going to drive the um, anybody that actually like does their hex map properly with like um, by doing the mountain ranges first and then working out where the water would go. I'm going to drive them absolutely mad now by just um, plastering some some terrain around. And I think it's it's good to not have them be too um, too kind of clustered. It's good to have like. The odd you can, you can have like one hex be something because remember this isn't saying that this is a hex entirely of hills because it's gonna it's gonna have woods and this isn't necessarily a hex entirely of woods each hex is going to contain maybe streams rocky outcrops changes in altitude all sorts of different things let's put some marsh down here oh no that's that's grassland we'll we'll, we'll go for some marsh Bit of bit of marshy swamp. Um, are we happy with that? Some I know these these say dunes, but we'll say these are like foothill type things. There we go. I think we're good. So wildland hexes. You just throw them in. Add six water hexes, and then draw a navigable river from one of these to beyond the domain. So six hexes of water, you can have one big lake. Let's have like a long lake here, and then we'll have our remaining two be like just left over. Because again, this doesn't necessarily mean it's a single perfectly hexagonal lake. It just means that the majority of this hex is, is made up of lakes. And uh, we need our navigable waterway. Um, I think it would make sense to have this go, oh, I don't know. I like the idea of having it go through the marsh. There we go. And this is the closest we're going to get to a road. Uh, in my document, I had a big thing saying no Romans, no roads. Because for a while, I had like trails and roads and stuff between the um, between the settlements. And if you're going to do that, I feel like you're better off doing a hex crawl. Uh, sorry, you're better off doing a point crawl. Um, similar to how it works in, uh, how Deep Country works in, electric bastion land is that the, the important thing is the routes between places it's not so much about what's in between whereas i wanted this to be about a world before all that stuff so it is mainly forests and hills and wild land it's not um it, it's not a case of well I'll, I'll take the road from town a to town b it's like well no you've got to you've got to cross the wilderness to get there like actual wilderness Um, Mike Cucurullo says, uh, since this is a world of myth, I kind of like the idea that the hex is at terrain is actually divided up into hexagonal regions. Well, watch this because there's a there's a button on here that made me hate myself because you can change the grid shape. And for a minute, I was like, oh, do I actually like having it as like a grid? Um, and I don't know why I thought that I liked that, but I, I decided that I don't. Um, but if you wanted to have your area be like a patchwork quilt, uh, you could absolutely do it with uh, with squares, uh, no problem whatsoever. So we've got our water, we've got our wildlands. Uh, add six blocked hexes, typically mountains. Look at it, typo already. What's that capital? This this is why don't give me typo feedback yet because that's that's um it, they're everywhere. Uh, typically mountains, ravines, or bogs. These cannot be crossed without a guide. I like the idea of a ravine, but there's not a 
Do we have a ravine on here? I don't really have ravine territory. Territory? Terrain. We'll go for some classic mountains. So we need six of them. Uh, so you know what? I'm actually going to scatter them just to prove my point about how you don't need to like make big clusters and kind of to annoy people who like who worry too much about how the map looks because I kind of like that the, these sort of six peaks might kind of form a little bit of the kind of landmarks of the region if we split them up but you, but you could equally put them all in one big range and then place 12 homeland hexes I don't like this name this is going to change but essentially homeland hexes are essentially settled hexes so these hexes have scattered villages and it's assumed that there are like winding trails between the natural features so they're a little bit easier to travel through um and these these sort of trails are the closest thing you're going to get to roads in this setting um rather than being like a big road connecting two towns um it's sort of easier to it's easy to travel between these little villages because you it kind of the it kind of assumes that there are connecting trails between these two villages um rather than traveling between like two random points in the in the forest where there's like why would there be a trail in these two random points um so we're going to put these 12 um some clustered some isolated um, I can see lots of suggestions in the chat. Um, I, I, I think I did have them called like fifes or something at some point. Um, but I'm trying to avoid... Uh, this sounds ridiculous. I'm trying to avoid too much like medieval language. Uh, and y you'll see when we get onto the rest of it that I've I've been completely inconsistent in that. But, um, but I don't know. that Somehow that feels a step too far for the tone that I'm going for. And I, and I can't quite explain why. So... Um, we need 12 homeland hexes. So these are, like I say, it, it's so if we put one here, what that represents is that in this patch of dense forest, there are at least a few people living there. So it could be like scattered huts. It could be that there is like a small village and then maybe like a watchtower over the other side. Um, it's, it's more of a marker for this hex has people in it living here rather than like some random hermit up here. So we're gonna do 12. So I'm gonna do like four, four in a cluster, then three in a cluster, then two, and then some individual ones. So we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll do some around this mountain. This mountain is important, I've decided. So we've got four, and then we'll stick three, I think three like around the river would make sense. So one, that, that's not very clustered actually, is it? So we'll do one, two, three. And then we'll put two over here. This, this four through two one is completely arbitrary, by the way. This, this isn't a rule. This is just a, an arbitrary restriction I'm putting on myself. So we've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, eleven, twelve. So we've got quite a few kind of populated hexes, but they are kind of quite isolated from each other. So place the seat of power, and this is commonly a castle and its surrounding settlements, and this all fits within one central homeland hex. So we're gonna put this somewhere near the middle, and this is your kind of like, who's in charge of this domain? Whose domain is this area? Who, who lays claim to all this area? Um, they might not have much direct control over it, but they're at least probably like laying claim to it. Um, it says to put it central. I guess like this one would make sense. I like the idea of like a castle next to the lake on the forest. But yeah, I can't imagine they have much control <laughs> if, if that's where the uh, the seat of power is. Uh, finally, three sanctuaries in Homeland Hexes. So these sanctuaries represent actual walled places. So whereas the Homeland Hexes represent kind of scattered villages that are probably not massively well protected, Sanctuary is a way you're going to get actual walls. So it could be a fort, temple, tower, or anywhere you might find knights or seers. I haven't spoken about seers, but it's it's a load of weird Merlins, basically. <laughs> this is my, my pitch. Um, I always liked the, the weirder, the weirder 
imaginings of, of Merlin as this kind of like child of a demon who like lives their life backwards. Um, so I thought I could do a hundred different versions of that. Um, so we'll see if I actually get that. <laughs> so we need three of them. So you, you could put some next to there, but I think th this feels like it should have some kind of fort and put something there. And maybe, maybe there's like another, like a rival, like a rival fortress up here. Okay. And I'll come back to the specifics of these when we get to it. Um, and finally, we're getting to the meat of it. So this is all like, this is all well and good, but it's not really a land of adventure, is it? It's a land of inconvenient transport links. Now we get six myths. And you're going to place them at least two hexes away from a homeland. Um, and mark them with their number from the myth table. We'll use their actual names because we're uh, for this purpose. But the idea is there will be 100 myths. And what I wanted was I had these myths in place already as like I want to have like 100 ideas that you can go to for like I ideas to put in your like adventure. But then I kind of wanted them to feel more procedural. Like these are like each of these, you can just place it in your game and it will start. It will sort of automatically generate fun things happening. You don't have to read it and then think, well, now I've read all about the spirit and I understand the spirit, but now I need to work out how to actually make it work in the game. I wanted it to just be something that works immediately. So the place I kind of landed with that is that each of these myths has a small bit of flavor text in a deliberately flowery um, language. It, it sets off the um, spell checker because I, I use a lot of words that words that feel like they should be medieval words like lurkles but it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to like it and then we have these omens and i won't go into the entirety of the omen system but essentially each of these is an encounter and when you're wandering around this hex map uh, you will start to encounter these omens of the myth that you are closest to and in general you will encounter the lower numbered things first and then they will ramp up until you eventually reach the final omen which is usually some kind of like some kind of climax um to the myth and um and writing these is going to be the thing that makes or breaks this game as well as so many other things that are going to make or break this game but um but yeah th this is how the myths work each of them is kind of a essentially a random encounter table but i wanted to see how much work i could get that to do because i didn't want to just use Often in hex crawls, you'll get these encounter tables that are like, well, if you're in the mountains and it's spring, you, you cross over into the charts, so you go mountains, spring, and it's the morning, and I roll 2d8 and I get 11, which means I encounter three mountain lions. And then you can go to the mountain lion section and you have to kind of work out, well, what does this mean? So there's three mountain lions. I can kind of work out they're probably hunting, but then it's it's very procedural and I do like that in my heart of hearts because I do like that whole procedural sandbox idea but I wanted something that was a bit more ready to go so each of these is a little bit more a little bit more like trying to be a bit more of like an evocative little bit of flavor text that's also an encounter and it does serve a third purpose as well which we'll come back to another time um but yeah let's um let's let's plug them in so you would normally roll them on this D one hundred table, but there's only twelve because, you know, I'm not I'm not putting a hundred in playtest. <laughs> um, so we're just going to pick the ones we like. So you know what? We'll take the first six. So we've got the plague, the wall, the spirit, the river, the wyvern, and the goblin. So let's put the plague somewhere. Um, the plague. We'll put it like near a town, because the plague, the plague myth kind of suggests a town already um what am i looking for here we go so we're going to use a star symbol um and we'll put the plague it makes sense for it to be in the bog doesn't it so we'll do that and then we'll we'll call that ooh, plague can i uh can i please see it There we go. So we have our plague. 
I, I will make this uh, big again when I can. Um, the wall. So where do we put the wall? I feel like the wall would make sense kind of, maybe it's here, maybe this, this area is like walled off, but, the, but the, the myth has to have like a sort of central location. In fact, I'll tell you what I'll do to make our lives easier. I'm going to put down all six. So we've got one, two, I, I can't put it there because it's not two hexes away. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then we'll name those as we go. So we've got plague, we've got the wall. Uh, what else did we have? Spirit and the river. So you're thinking, I know what you're thinking, this, this is the river, why is that not the river? Well, we'll come back to that. We can put the river here. We'll put the spirit here. And then we have two more. Um, the wyvern and the goblin. So the wyvern has to be in the mountains, come on. And the goblin is up here in the hills. Okay, good. We can get rid of that and get our zoom back on. So, the way that these work is when you are traveling, um, let's say our brave adventurers, our brave knights are traveling from this sanctuary up here and they are traveling to, let's say they're traveling to the, the seat of power over here. Um, so what they would do is when they move through these hexes, I won't go through the whole travel procedure, but essentially they will be rolling a random encounter for each move they make. And on a roll of one, it's a d6, and on a roll of one, an encounter is there right on them. On a two or three, they get a sense that one is nearby so, that, so they can see one at a distance. So they have a, a bit more of a choice as to whether to engage or not. And four or more, it's all clear. So on average, you're getting some form of encounter maybe once a day because there's generally two phases of travel in the day. So if they were passing through here they are, and they rolled an encounter, they would look at what their nearest myth is, which is the river. And because they are more than one hex away, they would roll 2d6, take the lower, and consult the... So what was it, the river? They would consult the omens for that um, that myth. So the myths kind of leak out into the area and, and affect the area around them, and they will gradually kind of ramp up. And the closer you are to the myth, so I said that if you're more than one hex away, you'll be rolling two dice, uh, two dice and keep the lower. If you're in an adjacent hex to the myth, you will roll just a single d6. And if you're in the same hex, you're going to roll 2d6 and keep the highest one. So once you get in there, things are going to escalate very quickly. And the thing is, the quests that these knights have is based around the myths. So they are going to want to seek out specific myths. But on their travels, they will encounter other ones as they pass through. So like I say, when they're traveling through here, they're going to be encountering river things, river things, river, river, river. But then when they get to here, they are now closer to the wyvern. So for this area, they're going to make they're going to encounter omens relating to the wyvern, and when they if they cross the water, they're going to be closer to the spirit. So they're going to encounter things related to the spirit. So the theory is you can just plug six of these in, and it gives you kind of an area that has these six myths floating around in it. And part of the guidance is that the the locals always know about their their nearby myth. So if you want to know about the wyvern, if you go and ask people that live here, they'll they'll know, like they'll know what its weakness is because they'll know the story or the song, and that might not be entirely helpful immediately. But if you can get them on side, uh, they will help you and tell you what you need to do about this this wyvern. Um, but I th I think I think that's everything. Let's let's double check our procedure. So we've um. We've placed our myths, and yeah, neighbouring domains can be assumed to be separated by water, wasteland, mountains, or a disputed border. So, 
if there are neighbors they're they're not like here there's there's no like it's assumed that there's no neighbor like just over the just off here um and the thing i said about no roads um this is why there's always a navigable river going out of the um going out of the domain because that would be your kind of connection to perhaps other other domains um and the thing I'll stress again is that this is the navigable river. There are other rivers around here. And in terms of the specific landscape of each one, um, yeah, Zurial Redux says, if they're equidistant, you just pick one, I guess. I did put in a rule about this. I did say, like, if they're equal distance, you can either roll off or you can roll on both and combine them. And I haven't quite decided yet, but I thought I would just leave that as a gap for people to, <laughs> to see what people feel like they should do because that's probably the right thing to put in the rules um but for now my my official guidance is i would say yeah just pick one what one way or another either pick the one that makes sense or just roll off if you're not sure um but speaking of of other rivers um the most important thing of this whole thing is when i've you know i've, I've got this system here for mapping domains and there's a system for like the passage of time and travel exploration there's there's like action you can take to explore a hex but i didn't want this to turn into a um a like travel and survival simulation thing i, I didn't i'm not trying to create the the wilderness survival game um or what was it outdoor survival what was that what was that old game called um i didn't want to create that i still wanted this to be a role playing game where you the the, the gm tells you the situation and says what do you do and then you you try and solve it um so th this is the only box out in the game but i need to find a, a better place to put it the most important thing even when using the rules for travel exploration and combat remember the most important thing no rule or system within the game should replace the core of giving players information honoring their choices and describing the impact of their actions so I'm going to add a little bit of a section about like zooming in and zooming out because what I don't want is for these hexes to just feel like abstract squares on a board. So the way that I've sort of the the the, the place I've landed for like filling in the blanks, I did originally think about well, shall I just have like shall I have a spread for like woodland and it's just got a load of spark tables for like here's the kind of things you might see in a woodland like when when they just say like well what's the what's the landscape like here like what what can i see um you want to have an answer for that and, and i did think about just having like spreads of spark tables but um origin but what i but then it didn't feel right and it felt like i was they were just working as like lesser versions of the myths and i wanted everything to come back to these myths so what we've got instead is at the bottom of each myth you'll notice the numbers one to six are building person beast landscape object wonder and hidden within not not necessarily hidden in a very secretive way but tucked away in each of these omens is one of these items so if you want to know about a landscape you can roll a d100 or just flick to a page and let's say we rolled an eight let's say we've gone to this page now this myth is the child but even if you're not using this myth these omens form a bank of things and if you wanted to know about a landscape you'd go to number four and you'd see a fog shrouded lake eh, fog shrouded lake no deeper than a foot throughout and then there's a load of weird shit going on with this child but we, we can ignore that because we're not we're not using that myth uh, we're just using it to generate a landscape and if this is a homeland hex and you want to have a building you can go to number one and it says it's an idyllic farming community and you're not going to use all this stuff about fanatics of the child preaching about his innocence um if you need an animal you can go to number three and you can see three seeker knights and a great wolf now how i highlight I, i've looked at like highlighting these in like maybe italics or something but i, I also don't want to confuse things um and you know the, the beast is usually mentioned in the encounters you've got 
some little stats here. Um, landscape is your kind of like, well, what what what's this forest actually like? What can I see? Um, Fox Rally Lake, sorry, we've done that one. Um, person, we didn't do person. Drunken child worshippers. And uh, object is the one that, th th this is the object and wonder were late additions. So they're the ones that are going to be, they're in their kind of earliest form. But objects are typically, I'm, I'm really trying not to say souls like, but when people talk about like how objects in some games, like items can like tell the story of the setting. I want to kind of tap into that a little bit without just, because the fact is these, these still need to primarily function as the list of omens. So they need to be like an event, but there will be some kind of object in there that maybe like hints at a little bit of the wider world. Um, so the, the object here is um, a snake fang rattle known to repel the wicked dead. And the good thing is they, they don't, I, I've tried to make sure they don't relate to this omen so that it's always hinting at other things that are happening elsewhere and giving you little hooks to spread you around the world. And finally, wonder. For a while on the document, uh, on my kind of notes document for this sort of project, I had a big question, which was like, what is this game's version of Arcana or Oddities? Because some some of the knights do start with like a weird item. Like this, here you go, good example. The Gilded Knight does start with um, this gold colored armor with a masked helm in it, and it has like a bit of a weird ability that is, is kind of like an oddity. But I didn't want it to be a game about treasure hunting. There are like, there are myths that are objects. So there are mythical objects, but I didn't want it to be a game about finding weird stuff in the same way that Electric Bastion Land is, or Into the Odd is. So instead, it's a, the, the weird stuff is mainly placed in locations. So the classic would be like, think about like in like the Arthurian stuff, you've got like the island of Avalon, um, which has like healing properties. Uh, you've got that you've got that forest that I can't remember the name of that has like loads of weird magical stuff going on. Um, you've got the Siege Perilous, which I guess is kind of a place like the seat that no one can sit in. Um, and that's kind of like just a weird prophecy thing, but you, you can make that into like an actual mechanical thing. Um, so I wanted them to be wondrous places. So another reason why learning the world is very important because you might find a weird place out in the woods that is not near, not near any settlement and it's a real pain in the ass to get to, but it has a trickling waterfall of silvery water and metal objects drenched in the water are repaired. So like six sessions later when you find the, the mythical blade and it's broken and no um no blacksmith can repair it one of you will remember oh remember that weird waterfall that we found uh where was that again and they have to go back and and find this place so it's kind of like oddities and arcana as as place is kind of the theme with those um so so with these little almost like random tables hidden within each omen, you can really flesh out the world. So you might look at this and think we're done, but I mentioned these sanctuaries. Um, at the very least, I would probably like come up with at least like a, just a two word description of like, what is the seat of power? It's, it's some kind of castle, but what is it? And what are each of these sanctuaries? And we'll do that by, you know, We'll do that by the method that I've just said. So we'll start We'll start at number two because we've already used number one for a few things. Um, so we want a building, really. Um, Christopher Burdick has named the forest and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. My, um, <laughs> But I recognise I recognize reading the name. Uh, Brasseliandi? Brasseliandi? I'm allowed to badly mispronounce British stuff. That's fine. Um so we're looking at the seat of power. So we might we might look at both landscape and building. So the landscape, number four. Uh, a winding pathway up a muddy slope, tree roots sticking out. Okay. 
and the building, we're going to see a crumbling stone outpost. So yeah, we're going to say it's like a like a crumbling crumbling castle among the roots. And that's all. We, we, yeah, I would come up with a name, but I cannot come up with names at the best of times, let alone on stream on stream. Uh, so we're going to call it the ruin among the roots. So it is the seat of power, but it's like a ruined seat of power, I guess. And then what's this one up here? We'll go to the number three. So the building we have is an ornately carved well, now stagnant. A landscape. A heap of huge pale flat stones marbled with moss. So I'm getting like a well, marble, moss. So we're going to go for like... Again, we just need the pitch to help you get your things moved. We're going to call it like the Tower of Marble and Moss. And the main the main distinction between these and like the homeland settlements is that these are like significant places. So you, if you need somewhere to put like, if you need to find someone like a knight or a seer or someone important, these are the places you're probably going to want to go. Uh, next one. So what have we got? For our building, a tall wooden palisade around a tiny hamlet. So it could just be like a walled town. That would make sense. And landscape, a rocky outcropping, a lone dead tree at its peak. So we're going to call it like Dead Tree Fort. Dead Tree Fortress. And then we have one last one, which is this kind of one at the, it's the gateway to the rest of the world, I guess. Uh, so building is a burial mound surrounded by a low stone wall. I like that. And then the landscape, trees torn from their roots, only branches remain. So like a burial mound. Maybe it's like, because it, it, it can be like, it, it's basically like a significant building or a significant settlement. So we're going to go for like a mausoleum. I'm just going to give it an evocative name and we'll work, we'd work it out at the time. Mausoleum, which I'm probably spelling wrong. Mausoleum of the Oaks. So we'll go with the trees. Tree, tree theme continuing. So, there we go. That probably gives us enough to uh, <laughs> to start to start the game. Um, and like I say, I'm not, I won't go through the whole character creation, but the idea is that your characters will start with and will start with a quest related to one of these myths. So you will all start with a hook immediately hooking you into here. So one of you might have uh, repair the spirit. One of you might have um, serve the plague. One of you might have um, break break the wyvern. And um, and yeah, that's what we've got. So. If you do uh, decide to play this, I know I'm like a broken record, but you can join the Discord server uh, to talk about it. Um, don't worry about typos, grammar, layout. That stuff's all like this. This and and the artwork I should say is all been done by AI, which I don't think is something I would do with a final book. I think I would want an actual human artist. I'm pretty sure. Um, although I, I do like how it looks, but I think I, I would want a, to work with someone on this. Um, so don't worry about all that visual details. Um, and my, my standard rule for feedback, and when people ask me about like playtesting feedback, this is the thing I always say, is um, the, the feedback that I find useful is based around how the game feels rather than like specific suggestions. So saying this part is confusing or this bit was too easy or too safe, that is really useful to me. It's not so useful for me to hear, I think the game needs a subsystem for playing the harp or something or or coming to me with ideas. And I do appreciate it because I know that people get excited and people are like, oh, I've got a cool idea for how you can make this even better. But for me, that, that doesn't work with my like process for how I make these things. So bring me problems, not solutions, is my <laughs> my line on a, on feedback. Um, so this will change. 
like I said, this is available on bastionand.com. Um, it's the most recent post on there. Um, if you can't find it, it's also uh, bit.ly forward slash PB playtest. Um, yeah, and Ezra says like that the one thing I do like and the one thing I would keep um, if I were to commission an artist for this is I do like that it's all very dreamlike and it doesn't quite make sense. Like sometimes it goes too far. Like honestly, trying to get the AI to, where is it? I mean, trying to get them to draw a knight just like holding a sword is an impossibility sometimes. Uh, trying to get it to do this wyvern, God, the amount of wyverns I've seen. Because I, I did just plug in this this flavor text as the prompt, which I liked how some of them came out because you could see how it kind of interpreted them a little bit literally. But then sometimes it was like, look, just because I've said it's all wing and tail and all jaw and neck, you know, don't make it all jaw and neck and wing and tail just because I said so. But the, 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 the biggest problem was th this flipping horse. It doesn't look right. I, I wanted a knight riding a horse and this looks like a either she's like got like a hand puppet horse, like a like a mock horse. There are no mockeries in this world, I will say, as it stands. This is not Muppets Go Medieval. Um or like a hobby horse, like on a stick. Um but it, this is as close as I could get to somebody riding riding a harp. Riding a harp. This is because I'm hearing about harp subsystems, riding a horse. Um but yes, check it out. As always, you can keep up to date with everything else at bastionand.com. Uh, if you want to get in on those backstage uh, videos that I mentioned, which come out once a month, um, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash bastionand. Um, for those who are waiting for their copies of Into the Yard, I did do an update on the Kickstarter today. So I appreciate that it's frustrating seeing different parts of the world getting their copies at different times. Uh, but I did a quick update on the US distribution. In short, um, Free League, tell me, they are distribution is about to start very soon in, in North America, hopefully by the end of this week. And we're hoping to get them all out by the start of August. Um, but I will update that as we go. Um, until next time. Next time I will be looking through, I will be doing a read through of somebody else's. Um, books something that's coming up on um something that's running on kickstarter now actually i'll be i'll be talking about something very exciting um and until next time it's uh goodbye for now